When outrage exploded in the days, weeks, and months after George Floyd was murdered a year ago yesterday, many Americans, particularly ones who looked like me, acted like racism originated with Derek Chauvin and was addressed when the jury said guilty. Others turned to the work of my next guest, author and historian Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, whose 2019 and 2016 books, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and Stamp from the Beginning, the Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, among others, jumped to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. Last year, Dr. Kendi also launched a new center for anti-racist research at Boston University, where he's also a professor. And now he and the center are teaming up with the Boston Globe opinion team to resurrect and reimagine The Emancipator, the country's first abolitionist newspaper. And if all that wasn't enough, he's also the host of a forthcoming podcast called Be Anti-Racist, a contributor at The Atlantic and CBS News. Oh, and he was named to Time Magazine's list of the top 100 most influential people in 2020. I think that's just about enough. Dr. Kendi, thank you so much for joining me. It's an honor to be on the show. What was yesterday like for you? I think I had a, a mix, you know, you know, of emotions, but probably the most predominant emotion was remembering when last year I, I learned that that Gianna, George Floyd's uh, daughter, really missed her father flying her on his back. And uh, when I learned that, you know, I was, it, it, it really sort of broke me down because I have a daughter who also loves when I fly her on my back and loves to play airplane. And, and so just thinking that that human being is, was treated like as as if he was a monster when, when the real monster is racism. And, and now because of that monster racism, his, his daughter is not able to, to do the airplane game with, with, with him is, is really what, what, what really predominated what I was thinking yesterday. We all seem to like to say that uh, this past year has been one of a racial reckoning. Has it been? I think for some people, and, and, and you know, for some people, for whatever reason, it, 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 it took someone like George Floyd um, or even Breonna Taylor or even the disparities and, in, 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 uh, you know, during COVID-19 in which black, brown and indigenous people have been killed at the highest rates to, to realize that there was a huge problem on our hands, that that structural racism existed, it harmed people. And, and so they became more aware or even more aware of the, the ways in which they're contributing to that. But other people um, have, have sort of continued to swim in their own denial. You know, uh, virtually everyone I know says they have read your book, sort of like everybody in 1963 was at the March on Washington. But even if they have yet <laughs> to read your book, I think most of them know that the opposite of being racist isn't uh, non-racist, it's actively anti-racist. Could you translate that into practical terms? What does that mean in a typical day of someone who's striving to get there but isn't quite there yet? What that means is, is that, you know, as we embark on the world and we see, for instance, a, a, you know, a racial group on the lower end of a disparity, we don't think that it's because there's something wrong with those people, we we when we see black people dying from police violence, we, we try to think about okay, what are the policies and practices that that are leading to this disproportionate amount of, of, of black people dying at the hands of police? And then how can I fight against that? How can I uh, challenge the ideas that black people are dangerous? How can I challenge that in my own life when I'm walking down the street and I see a black mm -hmm person who I don't know. Am I feeling uh, fearful when I do? How do I confront myself and change myself? I'd like to turn to the project I mentioned a minute ago. Bina Venkatraman, the editorial page editor of The Globe, was here recently talking about your joint project, The Emancipator. When it was announced, here's part of what you said. When The Emancipator was first founded in 1820, it was very difficult for people to believe that slavery, 45 years later, would be no more. Just as I think there are many people today who cannot imagine that there could be a nation without racism and inequality. Sadly, I am one of them. What do you see <laughs> that I don't? 
I don't think we see anything differently. It, it, it's it's that for me, I, I I don't believe we can create that nation without racial inequality and injustice if we don't believe it's possible. And so abolitionists in Boston believe that we can eliminate, abolish, you know, slavery. And people thought they were crazy, but it was that belief. It was that imaginary that really drove them. And, and that belief that we can create a nation, an anti-racist nation has to drive us today. As part of this, I remember in the opening of your book, you, you make a confession that I would never have made, that I gave a speech as a kid, as a teen, that was racist. Do you, do you believe and are as hopeful as you just appear to be because you have made that journey, or is that just a piece of your story? I, I, I do think that part of my belief in the capacity for people to change is because I know I have changed. You know, I knew, I know that 20 years ago, you know, I thought the problem was black people as opposed to racism. And it's been a journey for me to, 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 to this journey to, to be anti-racist, to overcome uh, and unlearn ideas. I also know as someone who is surviving, you know, stage four colon cancer, which the, the, the was virtually sort of impossible sort of to do, that even my own personal story says we can do the impossible. And I also know history in which the impossible has happened time and again. So why can't it happen again? You know, uh, uh, we, uh, those of us who were paying even some attention, have focused on uh, a racial injustice in the economy and policing in in. Uh, healthcare in so many areas. Can we spend a minute on healthcare? You're, a recent piece you wrote in the Atlantic about the coronavirus, and as you said a minute ago, people of color have been on the losing end of every single part of that, from cases to deaths to vaccinations. You wrote to address racial health disparities, we need data equality and policy equity. And you go on to say equal is not always equitable. Can you explain what you meant? Sure. So what we did right was we recognized as a nation that elderly people were, were dying at the highest rates uh, when compared to, to, to middle age and younger people uh, from COVID-19. So we were like, you know what, they are the most vulnerable to death. So let's ensure that they receive the vaccine first. That's equity. That, that, you know, equality would have been, oh, let's let's send it out to 20-year-olds at the same rate we're sending out to 80-year-olds. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and all I was stating is we should also acknowledge that, that Black people, that Indigenous people have died at the highest rates from, from COVID-19. And so why couldn't we also uh, provide the, the vaccine for those groups first, too? That would have been equity. That would have been providing the vaccine for the groups who have the greatest need um, versus sending it out to all, everyone equally, even though, and then that what that resulted in is what we're in right now, in which, you know, black people have, the, are the, have been the most likely to die from COVID-19 and they're the least likely to be vaccinated. You know, you mentioned, staying in healthcare for a second, you mentioned a minute ago your survival of, of cancer. I'm wondering if when you were in the hospital, you were thinking about one of the most to me, shocking surveys I've seen from 2016 or 2017, I'm sure you saw it, where white residents and interns, uh, medical students, were being surveyed, and overwhelming numbers of them, when asked about black patients, said their skin was thicker, they were more tolerant of pain, you know, on and on, these stereotypical, grotesque misconceptions. How, how do we escape that? So we have spent a lot of time talking about the need to ensure that that police officers who have the power to harm and kill people uh, are not sort of um, riddled with racist ideas. And, 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 you know, obviously others have, have made the case that, no, we need to completely 
reimagine policing. What we haven't spoken about as much is how medical providers also have the power to harm and kill yeah. people. And so medical providers in their education, most of them, you know, train for 12 years. <laughs> and, and some of them can train for a dozen years, 10 years, and not systematically, and to come out of that still thinking that there's black blood and white blood, or that there's, you know, different genetic makeup, so people yeah. need to be treated uh, sort of differently. You know, I, I am one of many, I'm meeting you for the first time, who admires your work. You, you, you are at the center of an incredibly important universe. And so while I'm sure you see it as a colossal opportunity, do you feel immense pressure to get it right when so many people are hanging on so many of your words and thoughts? I do. I, I, I do sort of feel the pressure, but I also feel the sense of, of responsibility in, in which, you know, I, I think that part of the reason why I'm doing so many different sort of things right now, uh, you know, is, is, is because I feel like I've been given, uh, you know, handed an opportunity to, to really speak uh, about the, the, the problem is, 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 is racism and not people. And, and, and I want to sort of use that opportunity to, 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 to move my people uh, and to move this nation, uh, you know, into a different place. You know, as a, as a guy who had a couple little girls maybe 20 years ago, they're grown now, <laughs> flying your kid around the room is a great stress reducer, trust me, if you haven't figured that out already. Before you go, uh, Kyrie Irving used to play for the Celtics. He now plays for the uh, Brooklyn Nets. He's coming to, back home to Boston, uh, to Delmar or whatever, in the playoffs. He's quoted yesterday as saying he hopes there isn't racism, uh, intimating that he experienced that a lot when he was here. That comes just years after a survey that was just so dispiriting when uh, uh, black Americans were asked to rate eight towns, cities in this country as to their welcoming nature. The least welcoming uh, uh, town, city in a landslide was Boston. You chose to move here, locate your center here, have you experienced the Boston they describe, or no, uh, Dr. Kendi? So I've lived all up and down the East Coast, from Tallahassee to Washington, D.C., to growing up in New York City, to, to um, going to graduate school in Philadelphia, to, to, to now living in Boston. And I actually uh, have yet to live in a, in a city that did not have racial disparities and inequities. I, I've yet to live in a city where, where there wasn't this belief that the, the black side of town was the dangerous side of town. I've yet to live in a city where that black town was, was I should say, neighborhood was 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 not starved of resources. And so it's certainly the case, you know, in 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 Boston. What do I also know about sort of Boston? Uh, and one of the reasons why I chose to, to come to Boston is because, you know, I have a sort of, my memory of Boston really extends back to the 19th century. And, and, and this was a town, this was a place where people were considered crazy for dreaming and imagining that we can abolish slavery. From Mariah Stewart to William Lloyd Garrison to Charles Sumner, you know, and others, and and so I, I, you know, I am specifically drawn to that aspect of the city's history, this sort of abolitionist citadel, and I want this city, just as one point it was really the cradle of, of anti-slavery, why can't we become the cradle of, of anti, sort of racism, especially when, when people do not think that that's possible. <laughs> Ibram Kendi, we are very lucky to have you here. I look forward to the next conversation. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you for having me.